what God will do. Isaiah chapter 9, and verse number 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. There are four names in that scripture, and I'm going to take one for each Sunday. And today we're going to start with Wonderful Counselor. Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be good. Come on, tell them it's going to be good. The Lord bless you. You can be seated here on this Sunday morning. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I want to thank my wife for putting all these pretty flowers up here. I'm going to try my best not to knock any of them over. She and Asher worked hard uh, to get them up here. And so I, I appreciate all of that. I, I want to dive into this series this morning and look at the names of Jesus. Obviously, uh, you know that um, Isaiah chapter 9 is, is a prophecy about the coming. Isaiah is prophesying about the coming of the birth of uh, of the Messiah, and you know, I, I got to looking at this, and and give me a few minutes to try to build up and go somewhere. But this has kind of been a, a deal in my family over the last over this last year, because as you know, uh, Chaz and Erica uh, had a baby, Gabby had a baby this year, <clears throat> so much of the year they carried those babies, and and um, Chaz and Erica, you know, they bounced once they found out what they were having. They bounced back and forth between a couple of names. They bounced back and forth between uh, Avery, which is what she ended up with, and they had another name picked out, and, and they kept changing it, and, and they kept going back and forth, wasn't sure. They had me so confused, I was calling her the wrong name half the time because she came, she came to be called Avery, but they had also picked out Everly, and so I, I, the middle name was staying the same, Grace, so I'd call her Everly Grace. No, Dad, it's Avery Grace. Well, make up your mind. Quit changing. And, and so they, they kind of went through that deal, figuring out what they wanted to name their baby. Gabby and Eric, they've done this with both of their children. They refused to tell anybody what they're going to name it. And they waited till it was born. They, they obviously had some names picked out that they liked, but they waited till the, the babies were born and till they actually laid eyes on them. And then when they laid eyes on them, I remember when Asher was born, they, they, uh, they, they asked the nurses in the room, they said, we got these two names picked out. What do y'all think he, he looks like? <laughs> it's kinda, that's kind of scary to ask your nurses what you think uh, your baby looks like. And they, they, had, they had Silas and Asher picked out, and they, everybody said he looks like an Asher. You know, now that he's Asher, you can't imagine him being anything else. He's just, that's just what he is. And, and, but, you know, the whole, the whole naming process, what do you name your baby uh, when, when your baby is going to be born? There, there's, there's a few rules that nobody ever tells you about when you start naming a kid. Like, for example, you know, when, when a husband and wife get married and, and they decide to have a baby, um, you better be careful about uh, naming your child because don't ever suggest a name of of someone that your spouse dated at some period of <laughs> can I get a witness hallelujah that's never a good thing you don't ever you don't ever want to do that are you awake in here this morning you don't you don't ever want to do that that's that's off limits until the end of all time you can't ever do that if if your parents or if your if your husband or wife's parents uh, ever knew anybody that had a name that they didn't like or maybe somebody in the family thought it was odd or weird or different then usually that name is off limits at we as well because you don't want to go through the family uh, being laughed at because that was a name that nobody really wanted the, the whole naming thing can take a lot of effort and it's it's pretty important especially when you realize that names have specific meanings if if you have to you really have to take your time and, and think through names, and first names and, and middle names and last names. You've got to see how all that works together in the world that we live in. It's, it's really strange. You know, you have to be careful when you're naming your child. You know, like if there was this family, the Mann family, M-A-N-N, -N, the Mann family. They had a daughter and they named her Anita. I'm waiting on you. Hallelujah. She went through her whole life. I need a man. Hallelujah. 
You got to be careful about stuff like that. I, you know, I, I took some time and, and I just looked up some unusual names there. There was a, there was a family, uh, that, that their, their last name was Wright. They had a daughter. They named her Eileen. <laughs> Y'all going to be a tough crowd this morning, aren't you? I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to wait on each one of these. It's going to take a long time. That would be kind of awkward, Eileen Wright. Okay, so there you go. Um, one of my personal favorites was <laughs> the baby that got named Lois Price. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. You even have to be careful about names, like even you know, when you go to get married. You have to be, you know, uh, you have to be careful. Because most times, and I know culture's changed a little bit, but most times the, the lady takes on, and it's like that, that lady who got na- her her name was Helen, and she married a guy named Back. And he said after ten years of marriage, it was true he'd been to Helen Back. <laughs> Come on, this is good stuff here today, people. You can't just go everywhere and get this kind of preaching. Preaching. I'll move on after this one, but I, I thought this was just kind of it, it just kind of stuck out there. Uh, the, the family name, their last name, their surname of their family was May, and they named their daughter Keisha May. Well, their, their last name, excuse me, was Ash, and they named the daughter Keisha May. You don't have to say it out loud. I'm just trying to get you to think today. You've got to be careful. I'm going to get fired, aren't I, Glenn? Uh, You've got to be careful here. I think that one will go over better in 11 o'clock. They're a little more rowdy than you. But what I want to do over the next few weeks is I want to take the four names that are in this scripture, Isaiah 9 and 6, a prophecy that was given 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And if you were to go back and you were to study history, you would find out that the time that Isaiah gave the prophecy was a time of a lot of turmoil, a lot of fear uh, was in the world. And, you know, the more you read the Bible and the more you see about things that were happening in the Scripture, the more you begin to understand that history just keeps repeating itself. Because the, the days that Jesus were born, uh, were, or the days that the prophecy that Isaiah gave were, were days of turmoil and days of fear, 700 years prior to the birth. And then when Jesus is born, 700 years years later it was the same thing the world was in uproar there was a lot of things going on but Isaiah gave the prophecy he said for unto us a child is born a son's given the government will be on his shoulder and he will be called and and I remember growing up I used to think this was all separate until it wasn't until later that I finally realized that it was all one thing but we used to kind of put a comma we would say his name shall be called wonderful counselor but it's wonderful counselor his name shall be called wonderful counselor that was one name His name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor. And I'm going to break this uh, scripture down over the next few weeks. And I want to look at that that phrase there for this morning. That's where we're going to stop this morning, the the, the part about Wonderful Counselor. There's two English words there, Wonderful Counselor. They come from two Hebrew words. And the Hebrew words are Pele Yoez. Pele Yoez. And Pele, uh, Pele, what it means is it means beyond understanding. It, It means that there aren't words to describe that. It's almost incomprehensible, too wonderful for words. So when Isaiah was going to describe the Savior of the world that was coming, he didn't have the words to describe him, and so he used a word that said there aren't words great enough to tell you how wonderful this Savior is really going to be. He's too wonderful for words, Pele. And Yoez is the word translated as counselor, and counselor means to advise, to consult, or to guide. And so Isaiah said that one day a son is going to be born, a child is going to be given, and his name is going to be Pele Yoez. Too wonderful to describe will be this counselor who guides and directs your life. He's too wonderful to describe. How many of you have found that he is that kind of wonderful today? He is a wonderful counselor. He's going to be God in the flesh. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And yet he knows you and he cares for you and he understands exactly what you're going through. Chaz has already talked about that here today. And so because he knows you and cares for you and understands exactly what you're going through, therefore he can be your wonderful counselor. I love the way 
that the writer of Hebrews described it. And, and uh, that I'm going to mention a few verses. They're going to try to get them up there, and you can just follow along with me as you can today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But I love the way that the writer of Hebrews described it. Hebrews chapter 5 or 4, verses 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest uh, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Do you understand this? Just leave that up there for me for just a minute. Do you understand that our high priest our Savior, this wonderful counselor, Jesus, he's been through what we're going through right now. Come on, you with me today? He's been through what we're going through. He's been tempted in every way that you've ever been tempted in. And yet he did that without sin. He understands your pain today. He understands your hurt today. He's experienced life just like you've experienced life. That's why verse 16 says, Therefore we can with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we can receive mercy to help and grace to help in our time of need. There is a thing about this Savior that we have because he is a wonderful counselor because he knows me because he came into this world and lived as you and I have lived was tempted as we are tempted and yet overcame without sin there is something about that that gives us confidence that when I am being overcome with all the cares of life I can go to the throne and find mercy to help in my hour of need I can find grace when I need it because he knows what I'm dealing with and he knows what I'm going through can you say amen some of you if 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 you were honest right now, there would be people in this room that would say, I'm in a time of tremendous need in my life. There's a lot of need going on in my life right now. And the good news is there's one that is here to help you on this Sunday morning. He is the Pele Yoez. He is Jesus. He is the wonderful counselor today. I'm, I'm, I think that sometimes it gets lost when we get into church. You know, we, we come into church. I say this a lot, but, but what happens when people get in church is when they've been here a little while, they, they get spiritual amnesia. They forget what God has done for them. They forget how far God had to reach to bring them. Hello? Let, let, me, let me just back up and retract for a minute because here's the thing. I, God didn't have to reach any further for anybody than he did anybody else. He had to come all the way to earth. So he, that's how far he had to reach. When I couldn't get to where he was, he made a way that he could come to where you and I were. But we get into this thing where we get in here and, and we, we get to feeling better about where we are and our life begins to change some and, and he's been good to us. And sometimes we forget that how sick we were when he found us. Sometimes we forget how down and out and depressed and, and unlovable we were when he found us. But we need to remind ourselves, you know, when people come in to our church and they come into churches all over the world and, and those of us that have been here a while, we kind of look down our nose and, and we kind of begin to think maybe I'm a, I'm a little better than, oh, thank God. We, you know, we're kind of like that Pharisee, the, the publican was praying and had his head buried and he was pounding his chest and the Pharisee said, thank God I'm not like that man. But how many of you know that the only people that Jesus came for were those who were willing to acknowledge that they were sick. When Jesus came, he came for those who were in need. In fact, in the Bible, there's a really interesting story when you have time to read it. The, the, the Bible says that Jesus called a man named Matthew to be his disciple. And Matthew was a tax collector. And Jesus walked by and called him and said, Come on, I want you to leave your tax collecting business and I want you to come follow me. And if you know anything about tax collectors, they were like the farthest people ever from God in the time of Jesus. They were corrupt. Nobody liked them. Matthew uh, got called out of this business that nobody cared about him. Nobody liked him. Everybody thought he was a thief. Everybody thought he was a robber. Nobody that had any moral compass wanted to be associated with him. But he is the one that Jesus calls. And, and Matthew gets so pumped up about it that he threw a big party at his house. And the scripture says he invited all of his other wild friends to come. He invited all the other tax collectors. He invited all the other well-known sinners to come to his house and to meet Jesus. And when the religious people saw Jesus, 
worshiping with those people. They began to talk about him and they were highly offended that he would spend his time with them. Why would Jesus hang out with those wild sinners? I, I mean, these are the kind of people that listen to wild music with, with raunchy lyrics. They're, they're the ones that watch R-rated movies. Oh, still hadn't eliminated anybody in here yet. All right, good. Hallelujah. Maybe this will eliminate. These are the ones that say bad words every now and then. These are the ones that nobody wants to be around. And so the Pharisees were beside themselves. And they said, why in the world would Jesus hang out with sinners? And if you were to go to Luke chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, you would hear what Jesus' response to them was. Jesus answered them and said, those who are well have no need of the physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You've got to remember that Jesus is the wonderful counselor who comes for the sick he's the wonderful counselor who comes for the sick so i'm curious this morning as we're all gathered here it's just us it's just a few of us having a conversation this morning so let me ask you nobody's watching this isn't live there's probably only three or four people watching so let me ask you something here this morning I wonder, where are you sick at this morning? Where is it that you are hurting at this morning? Because the truth of the matter is, truthfully, all of us are sick at one point or another. Because of sin in this world, every single person in this room battles with a weakness somewhere. Every single person in this room battles with a vulnerability somewhere. Every person in this room has a stronghold or a dysfunction somewhere in your life. So let me ask you this morning, where is it that you are sick? Where is it that you are sick? And let me ask, and let me just tell you this, it's okay if you're sick in here today because that's who Jesus came for. You you know, if, if we sat down face to face and you and I had a conversation, I might be able to see an area or a part of your life that, that I could tell, hey, that person is sick in that area of their life. And I might be able to ask some questions and press you on it and, and get you to begin to talk about it. And you could, you could maybe uh, unwrap that a little bit and begin to tell me about it. But then there are some of you who, if we sat down and begin to talk, you would try to tell me, and I've had it happen to me before, you would resist and you'd say, hey, uh, don't go there. Just leave me alone. I'm okay. I don't have a problem. I'm fine. Everything is good in my life. And see, others of you would have sickness so obvious that everybody could see it but then some would try to mask it so that nobody could see it and pretend like it's not there but where are you sick today where is it that you're sick on this Sunday morning it's the holiday season and it's funny to me that in this time of year things kind of get magnified It's crazy that at this time of year, the good things look better and the bad things look worse. The holidays have a way of magnifying our sicknesses. Where is it that you're sick on this Sunday morning? Maybe, maybe for some people here today, it's awful quiet, so I'm just going to keep preaching, okay? <laughs> but maybe here, I know you're still thinking about those names. I've, I've moved past the names. Come on with me. See, that's where you're sick. You need to come on past. But maybe for some people in here today, maybe like a lot of people in our world, maybe there's some of you that are just depressed in here today. You wake up and, and every day and you're wondering how you're going to get through the day and you don't really have any hope for tomorrow and you don't have any hope that it's going to be better than it was today. You're, you're, you're simply depressed. Heaviness, this weight, this sense of hopelessness uh, seems to envelop your heart and envelop your life and you don't know how to get out of it and, and it's an area in your life where there's a sickness. You're, there's a weight there. There's something that's eating away at you. There are people in this room right now 
now who are depressed. There are people in this room who struggled to get here today because you didn't know if it was going to be worth it or not. There are other people in this room, maybe depression is not your thing, but maybe you're living in fear. You're always worrying. You're always wondering what's going to happen. Nothing's good enough, and things are always going to get worse. And, and you live with this anxiety because you can't ever get past your fears. There are people in this room, I, I know, don't look around anybody right now, but there are people in this room that live crippled by fear every day of their lives. There are people in this room, there are some of you who you're just stressed this morning. You look at your list of things to do and you think, how am I ever going to get it done? And this season kind of magnifies it. How, how am I going to buy for everybody? How can I shop for everybody? I got family coming over. The house has to be perfect. The meals have to be perfect. Hello? People get all stressed out. Rosanna sometimes gets stressed out. Rosanna is not a clutter person. Period. You, you d- I'm surprised I've lasted this long. <laughs> but it's because I'm constantly moving. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's hard to throw out a moving target, man. I'm, I'm constantly on the move. She's just not a clutter person. You don't leave anything at our house that you don't really want. Or that you do want, I should say. If you really want it, you don't leave it at our house. You especially don't leave it for an extended period of time, and an extended period of time is 30 minutes. (laughs) If you leave something laying down somewhere, and you go to get a Kleenex, it is highly possible when you come back, it will be gone. (laughs) She doesn't like clutter. She, She doesn't want clutter. She, you know, she likes all the fancy contraptions and these things, but you can buy them for her, you know, to put in the kitchen, but she don't want it on the counter. What's the point of having that if, if people aren't going to know you got it? Well, put it under the counter. When I'm ready to use it, I'll use it. I don't want anything on my counters. I don't want anything on my counter. I don't want people. Don't put anything on my table. Don't, I mean, she just doesn't like clutter. And I'm telling you, like if three pieces of mail get left on the table, Rosanna starts stressing out. She can't stand to come in my office because my desk is perfectly arranged the way I like it. And the name on that door says, Pastor Larry, not Rosanna, get out. She would come in and clean all my stuff up. She she can tell you, this is truth right now. If things go missing at our house, you have to call her. (laughs) But she gets stressed out about all that stuff. And there are people in here that live with stress. And this season seems to magnify it. And that's an area where you're sick in your life. And, And some of you maybe... It's not depression, it's not fear, it's not living in stress, but there's, there's some of you that are financially stressed. Man, and this time of year seems to magnify that. Man, God, we're, we're already hurting, we're barely making it, here it is. The, you know, the thing, I, the thing that's amazing to me, about, I, I, could I tell y'all something? I'm going to give you some wisdom here. I'm, I'm going to relieve some stress right now. I'm going to relieve some stress right now, right now. Are you ready? Here it is. Here's wisdom. Christmas is the 25th of December every year. Every year. It's not like Thanksgiving. It doesn't hop around dates. I mean, I know it's before Sunday, all that, but before Thursday, but it, you know, Thanksgiving, the date will change. Christmas is the same date every year. So if you're financially stressing about it all. There's a way around all of that. It's called a plan. And secondly, you don't have to bankrupt yourself to try to buy things for people who don't care anyway. Oh, I'm preaching good today. Nobody's saying amen, but I'm, I'm preaching good right now. 
and you wonder how you're going to do it and it's an area of your life where you get tensed up and, and where dysfunction begins to set in. There are some people in here, maybe it's not finances, maybe it's not stress, maybe it's not fear, maybe it's not depression, but there are some people in here who are lonely. And you look around, isn't, isn't it crazy? All year long, you, you do just fine. All year long, you have this resilience about you, this independence. I don't need nobody. I, I. And then Christmas time comes around and you, you look over and you see a happy family over here and a happy family over there. And, and, and all of a sudden, this loneliness begins to sit in on your life. And, and you, you begin to ask yourself the question, you know, all year long, I don't need a man. I don't need a woman. And then Christmas time, why do I have to go to bed alone? Why do I have to eat alone? I hate it, I hate it, and people, people get lonely. Some of you, it's more about family sickness. You've got problems in your family that nobody wants to talk about and nobody wants to address them. And instead of being excited about being with your family during the holidays, you dread it. You don't want to be there, maybe because somebody hurt you or maybe somebody said something to you or maybe there's been a, 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 some kind of wedge put in the family that, that you're mad about and it's an area in your life where there is a sickness. What I'm trying to show you here this morning is that all of us, no matter who we are, are sick at different points in our life. But you know what you and I need to do? We need to acknowledge where we're sick today. We need to not worry about what everybody else is doing. And I need to acknowledge the area in my life where I need the wonderful counselor to come in and give me wisdom and give me help. You need to answer the question, where am I sick today? And remember the good news that there is a wonderful counselor, one too great for words. And his name is Jesus. And he came for people just like me. Three things I'm going to give you and we're going to get out of here today. If you're taking notes, here's where you might want to take some notes. But the first thing that you have to get hold of and grasp a hold of is if the wonderful counselor is going to be able to fulfill his role in your life, then you have to learn to be brutally honest with the counselor. I was going to ask how many of you have ever been to counseling, but I don't want to do that. Please. I got to thinking about that, and that would be overwhelming here at the refuge probably. But you know what, what counselors will tell you? They can't help you if you're not honest. Because if you're trying to hide, if you're trying to mask something, if you're trying to keep it all under wraps, if you're trying to put on for appearance sake so that nobody knows where you're broken, then the counselor is not going to be able to help you. It, it is more than true with the wonderful counselor. You've got to be brutally honest with Jesus because truthfully, there are so many people in our churches who are not honest with Jesus. There, there's a story in the New Testament, it's in John, the fourth chapter, and you can go back and read it, but it's about a woman who, who was very much like a lot of us in here today. She, she wanted to be loved, and she wanted to be accepted, and she thought if she could just find the right person, the right man, that, that it would put her life on the path that she wanted to live, and unfortunately, her picker was broken, and she kept picking the wrong guys. And she kept picking them over and over and over. She kept picking these guys. And, and she went from one man to another man to another man. And she went through several men. And finally she ended up giving, giving up on marriage. And, and when Jesus came into her life, she wasn't married. She was shacking up with this guy. And she met Jesus at the well one day as Jesus stopped there to get a drink. And, and when she met Jesus, it was pretty obvious from the beginning that Jesus was incredibly different than any other man that she had ever encountered. And so Jesus is standing there and he's having a conversation with her. And Jesus asked her a point blank question Where is your husband? Now think about that. He asked her a point blank question Where is your husband? And she could have lied. She could have lied about it. How many of you know that Jesus is omniscient? He's omniscient, he knows all things. How many of you know that you can lie to him, but he knows? But how many of you know that he can't help you with it until you come clean with it? And she could have lied to Jesus, and she, she could have ended their conversation right there with a lie, but she didn't, and she told the truth, and Jesus said to her, go call your husband and then come back. And she chose, speaking to the wonderful counselor, to tell the 
to tell the truth to him. And in verse 17 of John, she said to Jesus, she said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, what you've said is exactly true. The fact is you've had five of them. And the guy you're living with right now, he's not your husband either. But because she was honest with Jesus, Jesus continued to talk to her. And Jesus told her, hey, I'm the living water. I'm the one that you've been looking for. I'm the one that if you'll take a drink of what I have to offer, you'll never be thirsty again. You'll never be lonely again. You'll never have to look for what you're looking for in the face of another human being again because I am the wonderful counselor and everything you're missing in your life, I can be that to you because you were honest with me and told me the truth about where it is that you're sick. And Jesus was able to reveal who he was and who he could be and should be because she was brutally honest with him. Some of you this morning need to be honest. Maybe some of you need to be honest for the first time in a long time. You know, we sing, we sing the song, Good, Good Father, here. I think we sang it this morning. But you know, some of you need to be honest today and you need to tell God, you know, I'm really not sure you're even really all that good. I've prayed and prayed and prayed about something that's important to me, God, and you haven't done what I thought you should do. Where are you? My faith is rattled. My faith is rattled. God can work with that kind of honesty. If you can be honest with God, about how you're really feeling in the moment. It's not that he doesn't know. It's that he wants you to speak it out loud. Because when you own it, when you embrace it, when you acknowledge it, he can say, that's who I came for. I came for those who are willing to say, God, I'm not even sure I believe you right now. I'm sick in my faith. I'm sick in my belief system. And I need a wonderful counselor that can help me right now. There's some of you that may need to be really honest about your marriage. You may need to tell God something kind of like this. God, if something drastic doesn't happen, if there's not a significant change really, really soon, we're in big trouble in this house. Something's got to change, God. See, you've got to be honest for God to be able to help you. And it's quiet, but I hope I'm helping somebody today. Some of you might say, you know what? I, I need to come clean. I need to be open about this, God. I'm addicted. I'm addicted to something. And it's got me. And it's bigger than I am. And I haven't been able to overcome it. And God, I'm coming to you as my wonderful counselor today because I'm sick in the area of addiction in my life. And listen, everybody's like, oh yeah, yeah, you just need to say you're addicted to drugs. Yeah, but, but what about those of you who are addicted to pornography? And what about those of you who are addicted to sex? And what about those of you who are addicted to anger? And What about those of you who are addicted to cigarettes? And Oh, Larry, don't start meddling. Don't start meddling. Listen, anything that, that controls you is not what God intended in your life. The only thing he ever intended that you couldn't live without was him. Ain't nobody talking to me here today. Maybe I'm, I'm addicted, man. I, there's things in my life, God, that are out of control. I need some help. I'm sick in that area. Some of you need to be honest this morning and, and, and just come clean and say it out loud that relationally you're messed up. I feel like I'm plowing hard today. But there, miss, listen, there's some of you that are messed up relationally because somewhere in your life you were abused, you were molested, you were raped, you were. Now you've got confused identity and. Uh oh. And now, now there's all these things happening in your in your life and you can't you can't be intimate with anybody else because somebody hurt you way back there and way back when am i helping anybody right now 
Somebody else burned me a long time ago, so I refuse to trust anybody else, and, and, and I'm not going to open up about it. I'm just going to carry it, and I'm just going to deal with it by myself. I'm not going to get close to anybody else. That's an impossibility in my life. See, what you need to do is you need to be brutally honest with the Pele Yoez, the wonderful counselor, because if you will be honest with the counselor, God can heal where you are devastated and sick in your life. You need to be honest. You need to be honest. You need to deal with your sickness. You have to learn. The scripture says in Psalm 55, verse number 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you and he will never permit the righteous to be moved. You've got to learn to cast your cares on God and do what he says that you could do with him, which is trust him with where you're sick. You just need to be brutally honest today. Number one. Number two, you got to learn to listen to the voice of the counselor. Hello? There's people that have come into my office and wanted me to counsel. I am not a counselor. I want to tell everybody that I am not a counselor. I can listen. I can give principles from the word of God. I'm not a licensed counselor. But there are people that want to come talk to me, and I'll, I'll sit and listen to them. And after I sit and listen to them, then they ask me for my advice, what I need to do. And so I start trying to direct them from the Word of God, which is the only thing that I know to lean on. So I start trying to direct them from the Word of God. And as I begin to try to direct them, they start interrupting me. Because they don't want to hear what it is that I'm saying. How many of you know that if you don't listen to the counselor? Come on. I, I, I need to hurry. But in, in Mark chapter 9, you can read this story too later on. Jesus took three of his disciples up to the top of a mountain and, and God did this incredible miracle in front of them. Jesus was transfigured there on the top of the mountain. And while he was being transfigured, Moses and Elijah appeared at the top of that mountain. And you can imagine those three disciples were like, wow, we've never seen anything like this in our life. And, and they began to say, woohoo, let's build a temple here. Let's build an altar here. Let's build a tabernacle here. And then just as fast as Moses and Elijah appeared, they vanished. And when they vanished, God began to speak. And, and I'm not sure if I gave them this or not, but Matthew cha or Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9 and verse number 7, a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Everybody say those last three words. Listen to him. And if there's any words that God might be wanting to say to somebody who is sick in this house today, it's, hey, the wonderful counselor has come. Listen to him. Listen to what he wants to say to you. And I know that there are people here, I've, I've had this question asked to me recently, how do I know that God is speaking? How do I know that it's God who is speaking? How does he speak? Well, he speaks in all sorts of different ways. He's the wonderful counselor and he speaks and I promise you, he'll speak to you through his word if you'll seek him in his word. It's possible that he may even speak to you through me today and through the words that I'm using today. It's very specific that he's trying to say to you. He may speak to you through the person that's sitting next to you on the, on the road next to you today. He could speak to you through someone you work with, to someone you go to school with. He could speak to you as you're listening to the radio and a song comes on. He might speak to you through a devotion that you're doing. He can speak to you through circumstances that you are going through. But if you go train yourself, you will learn that God really does speak. And you can recognize his voice. And you've got to learn how to listen to him. John chapter 10 and verse 27, he said, My sheep know my voice. They hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. So number one, I've got to be brutally honest with him. Number two, I've got to learn to listen to him. And number three, maybe most important of all, above all else, I've got to do what the counselor tells me to do. It's amazing to me how many people go and spend 
hundreds and hundreds, thousands of dollars for counseling. But they won't do what the counselor advises them to do. And then they wonder why their lives never change. They wonder why their situations never change. Because you can hear, listen, the scripture talks about it like this. It says, don't be just, don't be hearers of the word only. Be doers of the word also. To him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. Listen, you've got to do what the counselor tells you to do. When he speaks, you've got to do what he's telling you to do, even if you don't like it and even if you don't understand it. Because truthfully, there are a lot of things that Jesus will ask you and I to do that, we don't, uh, that don't make sense to my mind or to your mind. He's the good shepherd. He may tell you to do something that doesn't make any sense to you logically. But you do what he says to do because he's your shepherd. He's your guide. He's the wonderful counselor. And there's a story in the Bible about, and I know that you've all heard it, so I won't bore you with the scripture reading of it today. But Mark chapter 10 tells the story of a certain rich guy. And he was addicted to material things. If he were alive today, he, he'd be that guy that you and I all know that's into his image and into his car and into his house and all the things that he has. And, and he, he, he wouldn't fully surrender to Jesus because all the things that he had were more important to him than what the advice was that Jesus was giving him. And Jesus tells this man, Mark chapter 10, verse 20, he said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but the man tells Jesus, he comes to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I've kept all your little rules. I've, I've kept them since I was a boy. But in verse 21 of that chapter, after Jesus looked at him and, and, and he said, what, what, what do you want me to do? Or the man asked Jesus, what is it that I can do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And, and you, you need to focus on the words that Jesus was about to tell him. Jesus knew where this guy's hang up was. And, and this guy was hung up on material possessions. But Jesus didn't look at him. And Jesus didn't call him a loser. And he didn't call him a bum. And he didn't read him the right act for loving his things. He didn't do any of that. But he looked at him and he loved him and he saw his sickness and because Jesus saw his sickness he looked right at him and right to him and he said you've got to sell all of this and you've got to come and follow me you've got to come follow me you've got to sell all this and the man said he went away sorrowful because he couldn't understand why Jesus would ask him to do that how many of you understand this this morning that because Jesus loves you he may tell you to do something that you need to do that you don't want to do. <clears throat> I, I know I'm, I'm doing a lot of pastoring this morning. But for some of you, man, it, you know, Jesus may be telling you, hey, you need, to, you need to break up with that person you're dating because that relationship isn't good for you. It's not going anywhere. And I know you don't want to hear that because you feel safe and you feel comfortable and it's not what you want to hear but sometimes he'll tell us to do what we don't want to hear because it's the right thing for us there's people not just here at the refuge but there are people that are in our world or they're going to sink the rest of your life financially because they keep making bad decisions one bad decision after one bad decision after one bad decision after one bad decision. And the wonderful counselor may be telling you, hey, there's some things you need to do. You don't need that $600,000 house. You don't need that $60,000 vehicle. You don't have to wear name brands all the time. Well, ain't nobody talking in here today. He may be telling us things that we really don't want to hear, but if I want my life to change, I've got to listen to what the wonderful counselor is saying. There are people, and listen, come on, Leland, I'm done. I met with a guy a few weeks ago guy's talented man talented 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 musically talented gifted 
And I went and I met with him. He's hit a bump in the road in his life. and <clears throat> He was part of a ministry and he has some addiction issues and his addiction raised their ugly head. And Where he was at, they, they decided, hey, that's enough. And so they removed him and he's kind of floundering now. And, and I, I went and met with him just to talk to him and try to help him. And man, I, I sat there and I was blown away because and I'm not being judgmental, I'm just telling you that I, I was just blown away because I went to try to offer some help. And I, I had a guy sit across the table from me and, and tell me that I ought to be able to do what I want to do and live my life and be who I am and still Worship, get up and lead and worship and people shouldn't judge me. And the whole time he knows that God is speaking to him about an issue in his life. But he doesn't want to hear it. And he doesn't want to do it. And because he doesn't want to hear it and doesn't want to do it, there continues to be a cycle in his life to where he turns around and blames other people. Mm -hmm. And he becomes the victim. Because it's their fault. They, they didn't have mercy. They didn't have grace. They didn't show reconciliation. They didn't show restoration. And listen, there may be some truth to some of that. But the truth of the matter is, when God is dealing with your heart about something, and you refuse to listen to what he's telling you that you need to do, you can't blame the destructive pattern of your life on other people. Somewhere you've got to rise up and say, this is all me. I'm sick. And I need help in this area. You've got to confess. You've got to be real. You've got to be transparent. You've got to be vulnerable. You've got to bring your real self. If you go see a counselor, this is where I'm trying to go today and, and I'm done, but you go see a secular counselor, they're gonna, they want you to be vulnerable. Because it's only in your vulnerability that they're going to be able to help you. And the man in Mark was unwilling to obey what Jesus asked him to do. And I read that again this week. And I've got to tell you, I don't know how to say this any more passionately than what I've been trying to say. it. But refuge, if we don't do what he is telling us to do. We're going to continue to live unfulfilled, unvictorious lives that break the heart of God. And not break the heart of God because he's angry at us, but break the heart of God because he has better for us. And he's saying, all you got to do is what I'm asking you to do. When he speaks to you, you got to do it. You got to be brutally honest. You got to listen. And you got to do. There's some of you in here this morning, you don't have the faith to do what Jesus is telling you to do. And the reason that you don't have the faith to do what He's telling you that you need to do is because you're comparing Him and His words to the words and the actions of other people who've let you down and who've broken your heart. But Jesus is the wonderful counselor and he came into a hurting and a broken world for people just like you and you're going to have to learn that you've got to find fulfillment in him alone and maybe if you come see me I can help you a little bit maybe if you go pay a therapist they might be able to help you a little bit maybe if you have a really good friend they could possibly offer a little help but ultimately there's one whose name is Jesus He's the Son of God. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. But on this Sunday, He is the Pele Yoez. He is the wonderful 
counselor. The counselor so great that there aren't even words to describe him. Be honest with him. Listen to him. And do exactly what he says. And I don't know, heads are bowed and eyes are closed in here today. As we enter into the Christmas season, why spend another season sick? Why spend another season carrying depression, fear, anxiety, stress, loneliness? When today, on this Sunday morning, the wonderful counselor is available. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. If you're here today and you just need to be honest, surely the presence if you just need to be honest today, of the Lord in this place, right there where you are, if you just want to stand. I'm not trying to compel you today, but if there's some people who just want to rise to your feet and maybe lift your hands and say, I need to be honest today, Jesus. I'm sick. I need a counselor today. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Come on, right there where you're standing, you just got to tell him, here's where I'm sick today. I'm listening. And, his and I want to do what you're saying to do today. I want my life to turn around. I'm tired of living the way I've lived. I'm tired I see of my life going the direction that it's going. I need help today. I need help today. I need the counselor today. I need the counselor today. I need the counselor today. Surely the presence. Surely the presence of the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel. Why don't the rest of you stand with me? Maybe there's somebody that stood that's by you. You can reach out and take them by the hand. You can help them pray right now. Come on, just speak life into somebody that's standing next to you right now. I see glory on each face. Surely, Surely the, the presence, presence of the Lord is in this place. Come on, sing that. Surely, Surely the, the presence, presence of the Lord is in this place. I, I can feel His mighty power, power and His grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings, I see glory on each face, surely the presence of the Lord is in this Come on, one more time, sing, as they're singing, surely I want you to reach out today. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, I, I can, can feel His mighty power. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Father, I pray over every person that's gathered in this room today. I pray for those who have come carrying their needs today carrying their disappointment, their loneliness, their depression, their fear, their anxiety. I pray today, Father, that they would just open up to you in this season. Lord, when we look and reflect on the hope that came because of your coming, Father, I pray that those that are carrying deep-seated fears and wounds and hurts and pain, hope rising as they look forward in anticipation of the birthing of something powerful and mighty 
in their life in this season. Father, I don't believe that your coming has to just be a one-time celebration. But you're wanting to come into people's lives as we close another year, 2017. You want people to leave out of this year stronger than they came into it. You're wanting people to be ready to face another year with the assurance and the knowledge that the Pele Yoez, the indescribable counselor, showed up in their life in the Christmas season of 2017 and hope was born all over again. Father, I pray for a baptism, a baptism of hope and joy. And we thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, give the Lord praise.